He went from being a prince in Pharaoh's court to being a desert nomad. But after 80 years, God summoned him to become a great deliverer of his people from bondage in Egypt. Next on The Prophetic Connection. The life of shepherds in the Middle East was mostly humdrum, long, uneventful days tending their flocks. The Bible tells us that Moses, having been a prince in the Pharaoh's court, had to flee into exile where he became a shepherd in the land of Midian. But in the land of Midian, after some 40 years, a remarkable event occurred that completely changed Moses' life. He describes it in the book of Exodus in chapter 3 and beginning in verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. Probably a bush just like the one over my shoulders, a typical Middle Eastern desert bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. He was about to encounter the presence of a holy God. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. And moreover, he, God, said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. He went from this place to even greater events in his life. He became the leader of the Exodus, delivered the people of Israel from bondage in Egypt and brought them to the threshold of the promised land. His heart burned with the word of God, just as this bush burned because of the presence of God. Moses is most recognized by the world as the leader of the Exodus. To the threshold of the Promised Land, Moses led the children of Israel, having rescued them from bondage in Egypt. Moses is also commonly pictured as the famous lawgiver who received the Ten Commandments and is well noted as a great miracle worker, the one who lifted up his rod and parted the sea so that Israel could cross on dry land. Yet Moses is perhaps least known for his role as a prophet of Israel. Yet the Bible tells us that of all of Israel's prophets, Moses was the greatest. So what is a prophet? And how did Moses so perfectly fit this job description? Our definition in Jewish tradition of a prophet is an individual who had a greater sense of God, a greater understanding of what God wants from us, a greater understanding of what the world is all about and, and where we're going in terms of our, our direction and then articulated that in a way that was accepted. Moses was a prophet because he was a mouthpiece for God. God spoke through him. So much of the Pentateuch, the five first books of the Bible, are God speaking but using Moses as the one to articulate his word. Moses was a prophet also in the sense that he was courageous to speak the Word of God, even though at times he almost stood alone when the whole nation was turning away from God, whether to worship a golden calf or to disobey God and not go into the Promised Land as they were supposed to. And here's Moses, pretty lonely, like many prophets, uh, just kind of speaking like 
a prophet in the wilderness, and uh, but he kept going. You know, he had a head like Flint too. You know, and he just uh, spoke the word of God with courage. A prophet is someone who speaks on behalf of God concerning the past, present, or in some cases the future. Moses fulfilled this role more than any other prophet in the Bible. After God encountered Moses in the land of Midian through a burning bush, Moses was never the same. Although he was reluctant to return to Egypt and confront Pharaoh, and although he initially doubted his abilities, he soon burned with the words of God and became known as the greatest of all biblical prophets. So Moses in Jewish history, he is the greatest of all prophets. I mean, there are many, the Talmud actually says that from, from Moses to the destruction of the first temple, which is a huge period of time, there were like a million prophets, of whom we only know of a limited number, very small number known by name of men and women who are specifically mentioned in the Bible. But most of them are not remembered because whatever they were saying is not relevant. Moses has a unique status in that he, and it explicitly says this in the Bible, at one point Miriam sort of is complaining about Moses' behavior and God says, wait, wait, wait. You know, Miriam says, and Aaron, who are Moses' siblings, you know, we're prophets also. Why does he think, you know, he's on... And God says, you know, you may be prophets, but Moses is different from everyone. He says, everyone else, you, when, you, when I speak to you, it's a different level. I speak to Moses like he hears me speak, whatever that means. So in Judaism, Moses has a unique status as the greatest of all prophets, the person who had the closest relationship in terms of direct communication with God. So his job in Jewish history is pivotal. He's not only the, the physical leader who leads the Jewish people out of the Egypt story through the splitting of the sea to Mount Sinai and to the border of the land of Israel, but his primary job, besides that 40-year period of leadership, is the transmission of the, of the Torah. Not only did Moses hear directly from God, and speak on his behalf. Moses was entrusted with the Ten Commandments and all of God's laws. According to Jewish and Christian tradition, after leaving Egypt, Moses encountered God on Mount Sinai and received the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. These laws were pivotal for Israel and the entire world. Through them, God communicated to the world that there was, in fact, a God-given standard of morality something that was unheard of before. The prophetic words of Moses shaped the future of the world, while keeping Israel focused on fulfilling its destiny, reaching the promised land to worship and serve the one true God. If Moses hadn't declared the word of the Lord, the children of Israel would have gone back to Egypt. They would have gone back to the leeks, the garlics, the gardens, all of those beautiful things they came out of. I mean, we think of it as slavery, but they actually had uh, a very fertile land to till, and they, of course, their memories were not exactly um, accurate. They, they thought about the good things back in Egypt, but Moses said, no, we're going forward, follow me, and, and they followed him. And that was uh, an indication that he really was anointed of God, because it wasn't always in their self-interest to follow the word of the Lord, but there was an authority in his voice, there was uh, a courage and a knowledge that God had spoken through him, and they followed. Although Moses was the powerful leader God chose to bring Israel to the Promised Land, Moses would never set foot in his lifetime. This was because of one incident that occurred just outside of its borders. When the children of Israel were weary and thirsty, God then instructed Moses to speak to a rock from which water would come to quench their thirst. Instead of speaking to the rock, Moses struck the rock with his staff in anger and frustration. Because of this act of disobedience, God did not permit Moses to lead the children of Israel into the Promised Land. Hundreds of years after his death on Mount Nebo, God did allow Moses to enter the Promised Land, if supernaturally. He was accompanied by Elijah, another of Israel's great prophets. The Bible says these two appeared to Jesus of Nazareth on a mountain in Galilee. Did God summon them to encourage Jesus just before he left Galilee for Jerusalem and to his appointment with destiny? This also had been prophesied. Moses would have been comfortable in this desert landscape he spent all the years of his life, 120 years, living in the wilderness. The book of Acts describes Moses' life in three distinct stages. First of all, he was raised as a prince in Egypt 
in Pharaoh's court. But having killed an Egyptian, was forced to flee for his life into the wilderness to the land of Midian. There he married, but he became a shepherd from a prince to a shepherd. And that was the second 40 years of his life. And of course, at the end of that 40 years, around the age of 80, his attention is drawn to a bush that is burning, but not consumed. And we read of it in Exodus chapter 3. And this was a great turning point for Moses. By this time, 80 years had passed. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. Exodus 3, verse 1. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of the bush. He finds himself in the presence of God. He's told to remove his shoes. And then God tells him what a great mission he has in store for him. He is called to be the deliverer of the children of Israel who are suffering in bondage in Egypt. Now, already 80 years have passed. Moses has been a prince in the court of Pharaoh, now a shepherd in the backside of the desert. But those 80 years in the wilderness would serve him well for the third phase of his life as he led the children of Israel from bondage in Egypt through the wilderness and brought them, in fact, to the mountain behind me, Mount Nebo, in the mountains of Moab. Today it is in the kingdom of Jordan and just over my shoulders, the northern tip of the Dead Sea. And this is the border between modern Israel and the kingdom of Jordan. This is as far as Moses was able to come. For God, at least at the end of his life, his natural life would not allow him to enter the promised land. And so the story of Moses comes to this seeming grand conclusion in Deuteronomy chapter 34. And I'm standing in the setting, and over my shoulder you see the high mountains of Moab. The one with some green on top is Mount Nebo, or Mount Nebo. Chapter 34 of Deuteronomy, verse 1. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is across from Jericho. Jericho is just up there a few miles, kilometers. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead as far as Dan, all Naphtali in the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the Western Sea, meaning the Mediterranean, the south and the, and the plain of the Valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees as far as Zor, which is down that way. Then the Lord said to him, This is the land of which I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have caused you Moses to see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. So on top of that mountain, after 120 years, at the very end of his life, he sees the promised land, but he's not allowed to enter it. Verse 5, So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he, God, buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beit Peor, but no one knows his grave to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not dim, nor his natural vigor diminished. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. Just the other side of the Dead Sea, the plains of Moab. There Israel camped for 30 days, and they wept. Their grief was so deep. So the days of weeping and mourning for Moses ended, now Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him. So the children of Israel heeded him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. And the book of Deuteronomy ends with these words. But since then, there has not arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face in all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt before Pharaoh, before all his servants and in all his land. And by all that mighty power and all the great terror which Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. So here we have testimony of Moses being a great prophet. But one of the great and perhaps the greatest prophecy Moses gave 
was of a new prophet that would be raised up among the children of Israel. This prophecy of Moses is found in chapter 18 in verse 15. The Lord your God, this is Moses speaking, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear according to all you desired of the Lord your God in Horeb, which means the holy mountain, in the day of the assembly saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me see this great fire any more, lest I die. The people of Israel were astonished with the signs and wonders that they saw on the mountain of God in the wilderness. And they were afraid. They were afraid of the voice of God. They trembled at the voice of the Lord. And Moses alludes to this prophet who will come. But this then is a mystery. Who could that prophet be? Moses lived about 3,300 years ago, somewhere in that vicinity. And he came to this mountain after 120 years of life. And he died over there. And God buried him in a valley beyond the mountains of Moab. But he had given this prophecy. And all the years had passed. And when would it be fulfilled? We have to turn to the New Testament, to the book of the Acts of the Apostles. Because on the lips of Jesus, first disciples, his apostles, we find the answer to the question, who would be, who was this great prophet Moses spoke of? And we read this story in Acts chapter 3. Jesus already having ascended into heaven, his disciples going out in the power of the Spirit to do miracles, even greater miracles than he did, he said they would do. And it says in chapter 3 of Acts in verse 1, Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, three o'clock in the afternoon. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. He was, he was a beggar, and he was begging for his next meal. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And he did. And astonishment filled the temple and the temple courts. And people said, how can this be? By what power has this paralyzed man been raised? And Peter and John are called to account. And so as they give an explanation in verse 17 of Acts chapter 3, Peter says this, Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. Your rulers. He's talking about the crucifixion of Jesus. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. And then Moses is mentioned. For Moses truly said to the fathers, here's what Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Then this incredible affirmation about Jesus of Nazareth. Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many has, as have spoken, have also foretold these days. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our father, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. How? They're blessed through Jesus of Nazareth, who was a descendant of Abraham. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. On the day of Jesus' resurrection, the Gospel of Luke describes him walking, coming alongside two disciples, 
who are discussing what has happened in Jerusalem, meaning the crucifixion of Jesus. They don't realize that it is Jesus that now is walking with them. So he asked them, why are you sad? And they said, well, don't you know what, ha what happened in Jerusalem? And he said, well, what happened? And they go on to explain to him. They get to a place called Emmaus, and he stays, and they break bread together. Perhaps in the breaking of the bread, they noticed his nail-scarred hands. Anyway, he rebukes them for their unbelief. And then he says to them, in Luke 24, verse 25, then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And then this, listen, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them and all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Moses got to Mount Nebo, died, was buried, and was not allowed to enter the promised land on that occasion. But more than a thousand years later, on a hilltop in Galilee, Jesus, a cloud engulfing him, and Peter and John, Moses and Elijah appear to him and speak to him, presumably to encourage him to face what is to come in Jerusalem, crucifixion and death. Moses eventually entered the promised land, but he had to wait until the day of God's appointed time on a mountain in Galilee, and with him, Elijah, another prophet. It's a beautiful morning in the Galilee where Jesus began his ministry. Behind me, Mount Tabor, pronounced Tabor in English. This was the setting for a supernatural event that's recorded in the Gospel of St. Mark and in other Gospels as well. But I will read Mark's account from chapter 9. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John. Oftentimes, he seemed to pick these three. They were almost like his inner circle. So he took them, not the other disciples, up the mountain, a high mountain, it says, apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His clothes became shining, exceedingly white, like snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. And Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. What's significant about this is these two men, Moses and Elijah, lived on earth hundreds of years before this event, this event occurred. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Because he, Peter, did not know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. This was not a time to speak. And Peter just can't help himself when you read the Bible, his personality sort of leaps off the pages. He's a sort of an impetuous character. And listen, in verse 7, And a cloud came and overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, hear him. Suddenly, when they had looked around, they saw no one anymore, but only Jesus with themselves. But why? Why did Moses and Elijah appear to Jesus? And why did God the Father speak to him as he did? Perhaps the answer is he was going from here in Galilee to Jerusalem. He was going from the freedom that Galilee offered him to arrest, torture, crucifixion, but thankfully for us, ultimately, resurrection. And from Jerusalem, the word of God, the story of Christ would spread to the ends of the earth. That's what we're trying to accomplish through the Prophetic Connection, our television program. We want to reach the nations with the truth of the Word of God, the prophetic Word of God, so that their lives can be changed as lives were changed here in Galilee as Jesus spoke and as he did his miracles.